Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Good. You comfortable in those seats? Yeah? Good. Get comfortable because what I'm here to talk to you about is not a comfortable topic. So we might as well get started. Does anyone know what this is? It's a little black sack. There's not a whole lot to it. What can we use it for? We could put things in it. Carry it around, I suppose. Who knows? Who actually cares? Well, I can promise you that by the end of my talk, you all will. You'll never forget this black sack. Its purpose is something you've probably never thought of or would even consider. I want you to imagine with me for a moment. You're coming home from work one day. It's a typical day. You're unlocking your front door. You're thinking about what to make for dinner, hoping that the kids have finished their homework. When all of a sudden, you're grabbed from behind, and this black sack is violently shoved over your head. You're thrown into the back of a vehicle. Your arms and legs are bound. As you struggle against this, the pain becomes excruciating. You're disoriented. You're paralyzed with fear. You hear voices. None of it makes sense. And all you see is darkness. In an instant, that nondescript black bag becomes a symbol of fear, torture, abuse, degradation, humiliation, power and control, and loss of your basic human rights. I want you to meet Jane. That's not her real name. Jane was a victim of domestic violence for so long at the hands of her boyfriend. When she finally found the courage to call the police and put this guy in jail, she should have felt relieved. She should have felt safe with her perpetrator behind bars. But that wasn't the case. When he was convicted of criminal domestic violence, his family retaliated. And upon coming home from work one day, she was grabbed from behind in a hood just like that one was placed over her head. She was thrown into the back of a vehicle. She was driven around for hours and then finally taken to a secluded place where she was brutally raped and beaten by multiple people. The whole time her head was covered. She couldn't see these monsters, but she could feel them and she could hear them torment and abuse her. After hours of this, they put her back in the car and then dumped her on the side of the road. She was discarded like a piece of trash. This was her payback for putting one of their own in jail. When she was released, she took the hood off and she was able to see the car drive away and she knew who the car belonged to. She finally made it home and with the help of a neighbor, called the police and got to a hospital. The hood that was used by her captors is often used for kidnappings by drug cartels in Mexico. Her captors spoke a very specific dialect from the region where they're from in Oaxaca, Mexico, a southern state. Normally, kidnappings, beatings, torture like this take place for the purpose of collecting ransom. But not in this case. This was purely for revenge and to send a very clear message. I think we can all agree that this was a horrendous incident. She suffered tremendously. The fear that she felt probably exceeded any of the physical pain that she endured. I believe that the memories haunt her and that her ability to trust people has been completely destroyed. I also think that we agree that someone who was so brutally victimized is entitled to justice, fair treatment, and services, right? Right, you're all shaking your heads, right? I'm sorry, but I left out a very important aspect of the story. This brutal sexual assault did not happen on the poor, dusty streets of a small town in Mexico that's overridden by drugs and violence and gangs. This happened right here in Greer, South Carolina, just down the road from where we are today. Charming downtown, the quaint little shops and restaurants. Did you hear about it? Are you shocked that it happened so close to home? You should also know that this victim is an immigrant. 
she's an undocumented immigrant. She left her life and her kids in Mexico in the hopes of bettering her life. She doesn't speak any English. She has no education, no resources. She wasn't aware of her rights or that she even had any. So let me tell you what actually happened. She went to the hospital to have a rape kit done where she sat in the emergency room for hours. She was never given adequate interpretation services, so she had no idea what was going on. I was working at the local rape crisis center at the time, and in the years that I've been doing this, I have never, never experienced or seen or witnessed domestic violence or sexual abuse this brutal. As the only bilingual victim advocate, she quickly learned to trust me, and I committed myself to obtaining the services and the guidance she needed. But that's pretty much where that forward momentum stopped in her case. As victim advocates, we know what our victims need, and we work really, really hard to get it. We were not prepared for the resistance that we met in this particular case. Her certification document sat on the desk of the investigating law enforcement agency for over a year before it was signed and we could proceed. The case was ultimately dropped because the victim couldn't positively identify her perpetrators. However, if you recall, she could positively identify that very rare dialect that was spoken the night she was taken. She could positively identify the vehicle that she saw drive away. Somehow these things were not enough. So no arrests were ever made. No prosecution. No justice. What she was left with and said was the incessant fear that these people would come back and do it again and maybe leave her for dead this time. In a country that prides itself in law and order, liberty and justice for all, she received none. It took years for her family to have any relief, and they still struggle every day with the fact that these people were never held accountable. We had a hard time finding bilingual therapists who could help her work through the high level of trauma and PT PTSD that she was experiencing. She had major medical issues because of the brutal rapes. She was discriminated against because of her lack of English and um, her lack of education. So would this have happened if she was a Caucasian woman? She spoke English, decent education. Imagine if this happened in a prominent part of town maybe in the 29605 area. Beautiful homes, manicured lawns, white picket fences. Would it have made the 5 o'clock news? Would there have been a countywide manhunt for these perpetrators? I think so. I'm sure all of them would be in jail today. So let's turn the tables around. What if it were you? What if it were you and you were in a foreign country and you got brutally victimized, who would you call? What resources would be available to you? Would you know where the nearest consulate or embassy was? Let's face it, as Americans, we would demand liberty and justice and to be treated with dignity. We would demand all these things. We would demand integrity in the systems that we interact with, but not just because we're Americans, but because we're humans. Human rights are commonly understood as inalienable fundamental rights to which all of us are entitled simply because we were born. They usually include the right to life and liberty, freedom and justice, equality before the law. We fight for human rights in foreign countries. We, we gasp at the atrocities that are happening in other places. We fight wars against countries that take away those rights from their citizens. However, as a local nonprofit agency serving underserved victims of crime, we see that this is not the case. We see that human rights violations occur right here in our own community. So here are my questions to you. Who decides who's more deserving of assistance? What kind of community do we want to live in? What is our responsibility? 
do we create an environment of hate and entitlement? Or do we create an environment that offers basic humanitarian services to those in need? I'm shocked sometimes to think about, you know, what happens in Syria or in the Ukraine, what's going on in those countries, but I'm, I'm even more shocked when I think that nobody here is all that compelled to understand why South Carolina is number one in murders of women by men in the nation. That's number one in domestic violence, folks. That is the epitome of inhumanity in your own home for anyone that's ever suffered or experienced it. And yet, we turn a blind eye. So if we do feel that it is our responsibility to put humanity back into human rights, it's gonna take us being accountable and looking at ourselves, looking inward, and figuring out what our own biases and judgments are. Why do we treat people differently? Why do we look at people differently? Why do we deem some people more deserving than others of basic humanitarian help and assistance? Why do we care what's going on in other countries when we don't look in our own backyards and see what's going on over here? If we do believe it is our responsibility to put humanity back in human rights, we need to stand as a community and decide what we stand for and what we will no longer tolerate. Because if we saw all people, everybody, as your mother, your sister, or your daughter, your uncle, your brother, your grandfather, we would be honoring those American values, that moral compass. We'd be honoring people in how we want to treat others, honor others, serve others, because there are no humans that are more human than the next person. So I leave you with this. How would you all like to be treated? <laughs>